Okay, so today on Move Your Brain, Move Your po- Blah, Move Your Brain, Move Your Body podcast, we have Jake Dunn. Um, Jake Dunn is the rehab process on Instagram, and he is also a strength and movement therapist in New York City and other places. Hi, Jake. Welcome. <laughs> hello, hello. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. We're very happy to have you on the show today. Um, I've here. yeah, 2020. Um, I've been working with you just like. Uh, talking with you, uh, kind of mentoring under you for a couple months, and I've learned so much, and you've been awesome. So we want to talk about a bunch of different topics, but uh, what is like? What have you taught me? Let's go a little bit into that. What systems have, have you been studying, and how did you get into what you're doing? Well, I guess if I'm throwing it way back, uh, I started my my studying back when I was probably a kid, when I just played sports, uh, I, I just did a lot of, a lot of different sports. And at the time I didn't know or care that it was movement. Right. But now that I look back on it, if I didn't play all those different sports that I played year round, had all those injuries that I continuously got, um, I probably wouldn't understand movement nearly as well in my opinion. Um, and I think that was the biggest thing for me and, and the turning point in my life and what I knew I was going to do. Um, so, from there, you name it. I actually started off with, I put up a, a story just yesterday about FMS being kind of uh, not my favorite. Um, that's just because, you know, I, I've kind of filtered things out over the years. And I think it's great for understanding, like, how you should turn, right? How you should lunge. That's awesome. I just think there's so many ways to cheat cer- certain tests. And um, that might teach your brain a certain pattern. So uh, that's one. Uh, I did a lot of... Um, Actually, Anatomy Trains, the book's right next to me. I love that book. Uh, it was great for me to learn, super dense, uh, but awesome to understand integration. Uh, for you, then I got into PRI, I would say. Yeah. And that was just uh, incredible to understand. Like, it was for at first as you're just like, what are you talking about? Like, how, how can this air movement affect my shoulder range of motion? Like, stop talking to me. And you know, then I had a few things occur where I had to believe it because you, you see it enough and you start to believe these things. Um, and so I dove down that whole while. And uh, it's been, I think, close to three years now. I've been studying PRI, um, taking all the courses uh, for the most part. Um, got my hands on a lot of good studying material on research articles, you name it. So a lot of different things. Um, and uh, of course, FRC, I've dove into that a little bit, um, not super deep, but definitely understand it all and, and love it. So uh, for you and you and me, we we're just kind of jumping into the whole, you know, how, how can I move better? Um, if I am moving bad, how do I even know if I am moving bad? Uh, and if I am moving bad, how do I correct that to make that movement more efficient? Um, so it's kind of, you know, trial and error thing, because that's the biggest thing for me. Now it's just, I've studied enough and I'm going to continue to, I think, but um, I've always been uh, the positive skeptic in my own eyes and how I can get better with myself. Cause I'm always yep. doubting it. I'm not yep. super biased. I try not to be, I'm sure we all are. Um, but I've definitely been you know, straying, straying away from that. And, uh, now I've just been continuously doing uh, my own, my own process. Uh, so that's why, uh, my, uh, Instagram is the rehab process. So for me, I, I look at it from many different ways. It's not just, uh, the rehab process. It is a process, but for me, it's a process of getting better every day. Um, how I can make people better, whether it's from strength or rehab purpose. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, and that's it. I just love, uh, putting my hands on people and, and making changes in their body and, and finding out what works and what doesn't work. Um, because what works for that person might not work for someone else, but I have my principles that I stand by and I usually find a way uh, to get some good changes. And if not, uh, I'll find another way because there's so many ways to you know, make positive impacts on people. Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like you, I don't, obviously I have not worked with you closely like Alina has, um, but it sounds like you kind of see rehab and training as kind of a spectrum instead of two isolated variables, um, which is exactly how I work. And obviously, you know that Alina works that way, but it's really, it's refreshing to hear you say all of those things the way that you said them, just because it's like things that, that we obviously feel super strongly about too. And people have, people have no idea. If you just follow one dogma, you're going to end up running into problems eventually anyway. And then you don't know how to solve 
some unique issue that someone just isn't responding to, you know, a specific dogma of care. So it's mm-hmm. awesome that you have so many different tools. No, absolutely. Yeah, that's a, it's a definite big thing where I even caught myself doing it at one point. Um, I, I purposely actually did every style lifting for the most part um, over the last eight years, I think, as long as I've been a trainer. Um, I first started off, you know, just doing those crazy lifts. And then I did Olympic lifting. I got into CrossFit. I really dove into Olympic lifting because I wanted to understand it. Um, when I was with the uh, Olympic track team down in Florida, actually, I worked at a place called the National Training Center where the Adidas track team ran. So all the people that are in the Olympics and will be in the current Olympics, they're all training there. And they are doing a lot of um, squats, Olympic lifts. And it's be- mostly because their coaches are there for that. Um, so it was cool to see. And I kind of just got into it got to a point where I felt pretty comfortable with it, but then had some injuries occur. And in particular, now that Alina would understand what, what was going on in my thoracic spine to cheat the movement um, to maintain overhead flexion. So I kind of like got to a point where like, man, there's got to be something different that for my body that might make me feel better. So I moved on to different styles of lifting. You know, I got into functional training. Um, there's a lot of good things with anatomy trains. I'll even point out, say, uh, functional patterns um, um, is a is a very good source of understanding how to move biomechanically if you understand the purpose of it all. Um, not everyone does, so there's a lot of uh, mixed emotions on on things like that. But yeah. uh, at, at the root of it all, it's just trying to understand mechanics and move better for yourself or whatever your sport is. You know, maybe you have to move a little differently. So yeah. So what was what was the injury that you had when you were in Olympic lifting? with the, your thoracic spine, like what was going on that you, you kind of alluded to, but I want to learn more. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> well, for me, it's, it's going to re- resort to back pain, right? I, I've, um, I actually got hurt my first time when I was playing college baseball. Uh, I was playing in Delaware and we had a, a, a coach, strength coach who's getting us to squat and um, I guess didn't really care how we were doing it necessarily, or I'll just put it on myself because at the end of the day, you only have yourself to blame. So I'll say, I guess I was squatting too much weight as a freshman, um, trying to put on weight and look good. Uh, and <laughs> it, it, it didn't work out too well for me. Yeah. So I, I got, I got hurt right there. Um, and that kind of carried my way and I can tell you how I got hurt. It's for sure. I was in extension. I was really biasing extension instead of owning it with, um, the floor and all the way up from all the way up to the glutes. I was just really using my back to help maintain that that barbell whether I forget what it was it wasn't a crazy amount of weight but you can get hurt on five pounds if you do it wrong you know it doesn't matter yeah. um I, I told this to someone recently um I felt I feel like I'm an athlete so I can move well I can lift well uh, I can manipulate my, my body but one day in Florida a few years ago I picked up a five pound box spring just from a, an angle and I picked it up and I literally just fell to the ground crying because I was in so much pain I'm like uh. it just goes to show like it doesn't matter you know, what's going on or how athletic you are. It can just be this little, little twitch and it caused a lot of issues. And then that fear can live inside you It can create, it'll wreak havoc in you. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's, it's so unexplained and we just need to respect pain and things like that because we do not know it all. Uh, So just run with it. Yeah. I I love what you just said. That's so true. And it really does go um, up in here and into your psychology of it too. Yeah. Well, and that, that will reflect in physiology and how your body just remains in spasm or compensates mm-hmm. kind of tiptoes around what it thinks it needs to do. But yep. that's where rehab comes in, into the picture. Yeah. Right. <laughs> reset, re- reset everything. I've always had most success with people just kind of almost like giving their nervous system a reason to feel the proper tension, obviously, because they're so, their body is so stuck in this like pattern of like poor mechanics because it's trying to kind of bandage or like buttress over an injury. Whereas if you just give them load with a proper setup, obviously like people are scared. Like you literally hear the word load and you're like, Oh, like, Oh, deadlift scary. But no, actually a proper deadlift is actually in my experience, one of the best ways to get someone's back to stop freaking out all the time, 24 seven. And I don't think even a lot of therapists think that like, I'm not even a PT, but I mean, neither is Alina, but it's just like, it's fine. I just feel like the way that we, a lot of the time are doing rehab in, in this country, at least from what I've seen a lot of the time is just, it's almost like perpetuating people's fragility. Um, 
And it's like you, I, I think it should be their responsibility ethically to actually increase that person's capacity within a rehab setting while they have them there and they can, you know, be aware of their mechanics and get them confident and strong. Because again, that like pain, fear, spasm cycle, we all mm -hmm. just said it. It's, it's like, that's the real problem in a lot of cases. Yeah. So Absolutely. Yeah. that's going to, that's it. It's going to stick with you and you, you're scared. Yeah. And, and that's why I think there needs to be a quick gap between therapy, mm -hmm. unless you're on the far end of the spectrum. I just got hip surgery yesterday. Good luck telling those people. And I pulled them out of bed out of the hospital uh, during my first rotation or second. Yeah. And they were just, you know, if some are freaking out and it could be a 30 year old guy freaking out, getting out of bed because he got so much pain. But it was the funniest thing. I walked in the next room and there was a 92 year old lady who had the same exact surgery and she got up and started walking. I'm just like, she's like, this ain't nothing to me because it's, it's just how her perception of it all. And Mindset. you know, it's, it's crazy. I know because totally. she, she's fixed, you know, it's just whether you feel scared or not to step on that limb. Right. Yeah. yeah. So Part same us, goes for yeah. anyone else. Totally. So that's so funny. Yeah. It's typical. No horrible. Joke. Also funny, but also <laughs> terrible. Very depressing, but. So <laughs> you mentioned before that you've studied, you, I mean, you're always studying uh, from what yeah. I have known of you, you, you study a lot and it obviously shows. Um, what are the systems that you've been studying and how do you merge them? Um, I think for me, uh, of course, I love anatomy trains and understanding how the body, you know, is integrated, uh, whether it's fascial lines. Um, but I, I like to look at it from a whole system approach. So respiration will affect the way that my limbs are moving. Same with the fascia or the muscles. They're all going to be doing relatively the same thing. Um, but I could be talking about all three at, separately right. if I wanted to. Right. So if I can understand all three, that's even better in my eyes. Right. Of course, that's very difficult to understand and I'm going to continuously learn. I, I mean, I don't know how long I just forever because I really want to. Um, but definitely, uh, PRI instilled a lot in me and how, and how things um, typically uh, come about with the body, how we're going to be side biased and what can occur because of that. Um, misconceptions on what we can see in someone's spine, whether someone looks like they're kyphotic, but really it's just because they're not, you know, they're standing up. So gravity might be forcing them a little forward, but without you seeing it, there's other things going on in the spine that might be actually an extension. Um, so that's how, even for you, like you've asked me before, um, if you see someone that's rounded in the back, how do you even know if they're really a flat back or not? I'm like, well, let's put them in different positions and see whether they can breathe through their back or, or where they are breathing. Um, can they fully in inhale and fully exhale? Because chances are the biggest thing that I see is people lack the ability to compress, compress. I want abdominals. They just can't do it. They can fully exhale, but in their eyes, that's a full exhale. But is it really? Probably not. Um, if people could really do that, they'd have a, a lot better chance of understanding so many things and not being in pain or having this issue or getting stuck in this pattern. Um, but yeah, so for, as far as that, that's PRI. I mean, another thing is you could even say Bill Hartman, uh, incredible guy that I've not had the chance to meet yet, but He's in over the internet now and he's doing very similar things, right? It's all, it's all relative. We all understand. Um, but putting your own spin on things and, you know, you might have differences between the system or that system, but you know, none of us created respiration. Um, you know, we're all just trying to develop it and make it a little better, you know, and seeing how we can manipulate the body depending on our needs. Uh, so if someone needs to deadlift, like you had mentioned, you know, they need to, they need to be able to compress very well, um, perform good valsalvas, you know, compress air inside of them so they can pull more weight versus a um, marathon runner, you know, might not, might not want to do that at all. It might do the opposite um, because they need to run long distances. Mm -hmm. um, but if they were to switch spots, they wouldn't be able to do that sport very well at all. Um, but then you got the people who like myself who want to be right in the middle. Um, and I, and I, I'm just that guy. I don't know. I want to be like a, a ninja. I want to be able to go over here and over here and do it all. Um, so it's kind of, it's cool to manipulate systems and, and yeah. see how well you can, um, you know, intertwine them. So I'll, like anatomy trains, uh, I'll do a lot of functional movements where I'm doing a lot of unilateral movements. Um, and that works great with PRI, um, or just 
um, manipulating patterns because if someone's stuck in a certain pattern where we're on the right side, um, but then we turn our body this way. So if you want, I can show you my little yes. Star Wars guy. So That's if we awesome. are here, can you see me? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so very commonly, because of our internal structure being asymmetrical, um, I can name 10 different things right now, but we, we tend to manage air pressure inside of us with a bias on the right side. So our hips, we might stand on the right leg more. So I'm gonna turn to the right, okay? But this guy doesn't wanna be looking right while he's trying to talk to you. So he's gonna counter rotate his upper body while his hips are still looking right. So he's on that right leg, a lot of things on that right side. So I could be, I can name what's going on at the ankle. I could be more supinated on the right ankle, right? Versus pronated or everted on, on this left. Right, because I'm on that side, I'm loaded. So these ribs on that right side might be more compressed versus the left might be expanded, right? Even when I'm rotating back this way, okay? So things like that, it's great to understand how I can manip manipulate respiration while also adding, say, anatomy trains. My type of, I could do kettlebell swings. I could do mace work. I do a lot of stuff like that because understanding how to just do the opposite is uh, very powerful. Um, and then combining the respiration with the movement uh, is great, but still having a uh, understanding of if I can't get my, my abdominals co-contracting well, when I'm in this position, uh, I might not see these benefits, which is the hard part, which is why uh, PRI and other systems have taught easier positions. So let's teach you on the ground first. Let's, let's eliminate gravity because me standing up and teaching you how to do a kettlebell swing when you've never done one before is easier said than done um, because I'm going to see a lot of things going on um, from this side versus, say, this side uh, unless I teach you certain sensations on the ground. But then again, some people that walk in my office might be super athletic, and I might put them on the ground, and they do the exercise once, then like, got it. I'm like, cool, let's get up. Let's just make it way harder immediately. Um, that's why I like bridging that gap quickly because I don't want to keep people on the ground because I've done it. I've been in the gym where I'm doing uh, corrective exercise or PRI, whatever it is for two hours in the gym and I'm just wasting time. Um, and all I really needed to do is learn one or two techniques that benefited me um, and then do my lift. So that's it. Love that. It's awesome. So can we talk a little bit more about the compensatory pattern that you just talked about with your little stormtrooper guy? Can we bring it back up? And um, <laughs> you go a little bit deeper into that and how how someone could wind up that way um, as an example. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, so uh, there's a many things that can happen, um, but very commonly uh, we might bias that that right side uh, and. Again, I also see this more now. I'll, I'll just be honest with the whole uh, rotation. Some people will call it the left, sta left AIC, right? Uh, Pure, I refer to that. Um, but I also see a lot of people who are just bilaterally extended. So PEC, they might call it, or for me, I'm just going to say they're extended. So they're in an anterior tilt and a shift, probably anterior. Everything's going forward because we're falling forward every step we take. Um, so those people are going to have calves that are just nonstop on, always on. They're not strong, um, but they're always on. So if, if we're in that position, again, because of that, that right hemidiaphragm being a little bit more dominant, we are going to start to orient our hips to the right. Um, and then our body, again, doesn't, it doesn't want to just face that way. So it's going to counter rotate. So you'll see that right BC, as Pierre, I would call it, the whole front on this right side will become constricted because it's turning you back this way, right? And then a lot of times you'll see that left shoulder pop up, okay? So that left shoulder will pop up, so elevate and retract slightly, okay? So left upper trap pain, very common. You'll see it in almost 80% uh, of people. You'll see their left shoulder a little higher than the right. Um, people who are more severe might be more. Um, the, uh, the idea for me is not to necessarily fix their shoulder, height, it's to get them to understand everything down below first. And a lot of times that corrects a lot of it. Do I think some people will always have a left shoulder that, that's higher than the right? Yeah. And I'm not going to like be testy to like try and make it perfect because I don't think we're ever going to be symmetrical um, since our insides are completely asymmetrical. 
um, unless our training becomes so asymmetrical out on the outside and we have just this in, innate ability to understand every day of our lives. Like, whoa, I'm feeling like my left shoulder is a little bit more elevated today. Let me do an extra set of left obliques or something like that. I just don't think it's going to happen. I think we just need to be comfortable with understanding that we're going to be a little twisted, turned, and more importantly, don't have pain when we're doing it or mm -hmm. discomfort. We feel fine. You can go deadlift, bilateral deadlifts, and come out of it okay, right? Um, as long as you're just not getting a, stuck in a certain pattern. But um, on top of that, we can. I can easily say uh, people who are doing anything overhead, um, they're going to be extending chest out. That's a big cue that I'm not a big fan of that I was taught. And I think it single-handedly was the cue that got me hurt. Um, other than the fact that I was performing the lift, uh, I would say, because I was constantly thinking chest out, chest out, but not understanding what that means. And now that I understand what chest out means, um, I could be given that cue now. And I think I would do it right. However, the way I would do it is, is I would maintain Extend. abdominal control and yeah. now I would just inhale and my chest would come out first fully just pushing my spine forward. So that's the difference. Um, part of the FMS thing that I just re or posted recently is why I said I wasn't too big of a fan is because I can do that overhead squat, no problem. But am, am I fully extended in my T-spine? More than likely. Um, and I think there's going to be a level of um, instability when you're under that bar or like I see Alina doing all the time with her heavy snatches that she does. Yep. I love it. I love it. So <laughs> I just think, you know, this, and you do it so well, or your body loves you. Your body yep. loves you. Your body wants to keep you safe and it's going to, it doesn't care how it does it. So I just, just for me personally, just because of all the injuries and personally trying all these different styles of lifting. Um, I just kind of came to find what I think works best for me. Um, what I feel good with. Um, and for me that, that spine going forward, I'm just uh, trying to stay away from it as much as I can because we get stuck there, it, which is that compensatory issue. It's a lot, it's a lot easier um, to keep going in extension um, versus going towards flexion when you're stuck in extension, right? But if we were stuck in flexion, it'd be the opposite, but we're never like that because we walk forwards. Um, so that's kind of what happens. I could say uh, if I was breaking it down, why people do that is when we walk forwards, right? If you see someone walk walk right next to you, your body's going to want to go backwards because we're always trying to counter rotate on each other. We're always trying to fight that. So if we're if we're going forwards, our body's going to want to go backwards. So my chest is going to go out, um, and that's going to cause a lot of changes in the spine from the T spine all the way up to the cervical spine, um, and basically start to reverse those issues or sorry the normal curvatures that we have in the spine, which is the lordosis in the lumbar spine, kyphosis in the thoracic, and lordosis in the cervical spine. So we want to keep those curves, um, but be able to go with twist and turn in any position. Um, and I would say the whole, the, like some people are hating on the term neutral spine. Um, and that's cool. I guess it's just your understanding of what neutral spine is. I want to be able to twist, turn in every position. But if I say, come back to a neutral spine, I'm going to think 30 degrees of lumbar lordosis, you know, kyphosis up here. That's what I'm thinking. So I don't necessarily hate that term as long as I understand what that means and can I move and, and get in and out of certain positions without getting stuck in those positions. Yeah. So can you, um, you said that a lot of people are stuck in thoracic extension or, okay, are people not stuck in lumbar extension more so than thoracic extension or maybe because I don't have, I don't, it sounds like I probably don't have the same lens as you guys, but mm -hmm. for most of the patients that I've been around, I feel like their shoulder range of motion is limited <clears throat> in part because they can't, I mean, they're literally so, so tight in their upper back and it appears to be flexion. But I remember you earlier said that you, it appears to be flexed, but it wasn't. So I just wanted to learn for my own selfish reasons and probably other yeah. people that were listening to this that have a little bit of knowledge about like what they think they see too. Cause I've always, at least like when a lot of people that come to me that are having squat pain, it's their low back. Um, because they're actually not able to externally rotate their shoulders or, you know, retract and depress their scapula and get their, their upper back to actually, you know, hold up the bar as well, or their glutes and their hips to open up. Mm -hmm. Um, so can you please explain that a little bit more? Cause I'm actually genuinely. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Buckle um, up, Megan. Time to learn. <laughs> Stop me anytime you need me. Cause I will okay. ramble on. Uh, <laughs> so yes. Can I say that it's down below? Absolutely. Uh, I can say that we are 
our, our spines are positioned. We were born right for that lumbar lordosis, right? Mm -hmm. We're supposed to have that. So it's already positioned in that manner. Our vertebrae are already positioned there. They're not going, they're not in extension. They might move further yeah. in extension, but they're yeah. already posi positioned there versus the, you know, T-spine is the opposite, right? Yeah. So um, when someone doesn't know how to manage air pressure very well, I would say I would back everything off that I said and, and blame it on that. I would blame yeah. it on inability to understand how to manage air yeah. pressure okay. and totally send air that. multidirectional expansion. Yeah. So where's and my... Maintain neutral, right? That's yes. The goal, I'm grabbing this for you. Okay. We are saying the same thing. I was just making sure because I... Yeah. Was, I didn't want to so, say I was disagreeing with you, but I was super confused because I didn't think that. <laughs> but cool. Okay. Got it. So when I got this teacup here, right? Yeah. So back in school when I was taught how to do a posterior and anterior pelvic tilts, oh. the teacup <laughs> getting poured forward and backwards, right? Uh -huh. So... So anterior tilt, yeah. posterior tilt, the oh, same thing. So the water's pouring out for posterior tilt, right? It's posterior pouring out backwards, right? The same thing goes if I were to take a small little ball, a little bouncy ball, and if I were to go, say my abdominals are, are right here, right? I tilt this forward, okay? So I got that excessive extension in the lumbar spine, right? Totally, yeah. Right? So now if I were to, air pressure is right here. If I were to be here, start here, and I just drop this ball, where is it going to bounce when it hits that center of the cup? Where is it going to ricochet? In the back. If it's, if it's going this way, if it's going to go, forward, it's gonna go here, it's okay, going to yeah. bounce. Boom. It's right? hitting the cup in the, okay. Yep. So people can bounce it here. It's hitting yeah. the cup in the back and it's bouncing yeah. forward. Sorry. I needed a ball and I don't have forward. one. No, I that's failed. okay. <laughs> so it would, it would bounce straight up this way and now this way, this way. So yeah. that's air pressure shooting straight to your abdominals when you're in this extended position in the lumbar spine even farther. So now that's putting their abdominals on an eccentric orientation. So now they're, they're really asking them to work even more than they ever could before. So they're constantly stretching their abdominals, stretching. That's, that's if they don't have any control. And if they have some control, maybe they're working them in an eccentric manner, hopefully. Um, but very commonly, the six pack likes to take over. And that, that's a muscle that uh, it'll wreak havoc on your sternum if you allow it to. So um, I would say that excessive lumbar lord is where they are moving in extension, completely agree with you. Because of that, they don't want to fall forwards anymore. So now they start to retract their shoulder blades because of that. And now as they're retracting their shoulder blades, what really happening, it's just their thoracic spine is actually moving forward. Because if I were to retract my shoulder blades like this, mm -hmm. that's a big difference than doing this. Mm -hmm. So chest out is much different unless I were to actually know how to retract my shoulder blades, but that won't help us from falling forwards. Yeah. What will help us from falling forwards is actually sending our T-spine forwards with the lumbar spine that's going forward as well. Okay, so it's kind of counteracting it. So we just maintain this, this uh, homeostasis, this balance, because we don't want to fall. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and because of that, we breathe in that position, all right? And now air is definitely going to the belly because you can't get that butt in a posterior tilt to save your life. And you can't get those ribs to come down because you no longer have abdominal control because those abdominals are eccentrically oriented. So they're stretched. They're just going, they're going crazy and they're like freaking out on you. And a lot of things like that happen. Um, so hopefully that kind of clears that. Yeah, it totally does. It'd be so cool to be able to see like with x-ray vision, different people's bodies or spines, at least when they squat. Like yeah, they actually have squat. that now. They actually, oh. at least unless I'm being fooled, I don't know. I thought I saw an, a functional MRI. You know where the people are they're moving and i'm seeing it inside i'm like that's oh, great that's where's cool. that been the last 10 years Sounds um, like wow. <laughs> yeah oh yeah for sure uh, <laughs> but if you can if you can picture that if you have the principles and you can understand it then you're like oh so that this will this tilting will affect where airflow is going or totally. it'll put more emphasis on a certain muscle to work better or work less so front yeah. and backbone we want you know we want balance neutral uh symmetry some something like that right yeah um it just doesn't happen like that usually because we don't walk backwards. Yeah. yeah. I love the the visual you explained about walking forwards and falling and how we're always going to be trying to stop ourselves. I love that. Um, mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, with people that I work with, I see so much retraction. Like everybody is stuck in retraction. So talk about why protraction is important, why teaching protraction is important, mm -hmm. I should say. Uh, are we talking about someone uh, with a certain issue down below? 
Or are we're we... talking about scapular retraction and protraction, just so everybody knows. That scapula is your shoulder yeah. blade. So what about, so I'll talk to Alina, it's about you then. Do you tell me, yeah. are we talking about a wide or angle or are we talking about narrow? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay, so let me <laughs> just you... do this then. So if we want, if I want someone, say a wide, right? Yeah. Well, they need external obliques, right? They're going to need a serratus as well because we're trying to retract those ribs because they're so flared out, right? So I can move different attachment sites um, on each other, right? So in school we learned there is an origin insertion. When really, in my eyes, you, you there's no origin because you can't move the origin from what they're saying in the books, um, which is incredible. They still teach that. Um, uh, so if you think about the the origin insertion of the scapula, right? If you're just doing normal movement of the scapula, you're just reaching, right? Um, but the origin on those ribs, right? They couldn't possibly move, could they? No, they can. We just need to learn how to exhale a good exhalation mm. as well as reaching and then also um, co-contracting with those abdominals to pull those ribs back. And that will start to narrow that infrasternal angle as they're using those external obliques to close off that angle that's from here. Now trying to close it off, right? Because I want this angle down here you know, versus a narrow angle is going to be more closed in general. So that could be a lot of females. Um, and I would say in general, the, those are just the, the differences. So those people that are wide might be very compressed anterior to posterior. So they might be, if I'm, if I'm this guy, picture I just smashed him with uh, two rocks from front and back. He would, he would squish out sideways, which is why all the bodybuilders – and power, and power lifters, lifters have big lats, right? They got lats. Because they they're pets. breathing like that, right? They're compressing their their body like a, yes, like a tube. They're compressing them. And then they live there because they don't know anything else. Um, and so like, the vice versa would be for someone who might be a narrow could easily be just the opposite where they could be compressed this way. So they might stick out more here. I see rib flares on those people a lot of the times. Um, I see, I see everything. It's crazy. There's never really just that one person. It's always, they're always right. a combination of so many things, but you'll, you'll be taught um, that this person's either compressed or, you know, they're expanded or they have a wide angle or a narrow angle. But honestly, I see everything. I see a combination in everybody. Um, I'd actually love to see the super compressed to the super narrows because then I know exactly what to do with them no matter what. Uh, even though I've seen a few of them, but you know, I just think everyone's, uh, a little bit different, but we all need a little bit of everything um, when it comes to that. But those 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 reaches for um, for numerous planes of motion, right? So the retracting the ribs, I could also use the serratus to help shift me over to one side, right? Um, but if that person is, let's say, a flat back, right? So their spine's already forward, okay? Um, they need to send their back ribs back, and we use a reach for that. Okay. Right. Are you using, you're using that, right? Yeah. Which ones are you typically doing? Um, I've been playing with the right arm reach to help for anybody with like superior T4 to pull the, these guys okay. down. Cool. So with that, then we got, we got that, uh, subclavius that's just, uh, mm -hmm. killing us. Right. I have it. I'm a T4 anytime yeah. I want, I want to be, um, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's tough. You know, we love to use this. Yeah. Uh, to help help us breathe um, instead of understanding how to co contract the abdominals um, and the hamstrings, glutes down below um, to you know inhibit certain things. And if we just understood how to do that, we probably wouldn't have these issues. But we live in a world where we're constantly putting our head down a text on our phone, um, and I know I do it every second of the day. So when I'm doing that, I'm already clogging my airway. So if I'm now restricting my airway, from say I'm doing a, a anything, a chin tuck or just head down, I'm restricting my airflow. So what am I gonna do to breathe better? I'm gonna call on these neck muscles to help. And they're gonna constantly work. They're gonna constantly pull up those first few rib. Uh, and I'm gonna have a lot of issues with that SEM, especially on the right, um, those scalenes. And it's just gonna wreak havoc on me. So I need uh, certain reaches, um, certain sensations down below as well to help get me out of this and tell these guys that they don't need to help as much as they do. Um, well, they're, they're accessory muscles for a reason. They're there to help a little bit when needed, um, not 24 hours a day. But if we breathe with, with our mouths, 
we're going to do them all the time. Yeah. Yeah. That you definitely just covered that. That was really good. Um, maybe let's talk about why posterior tilt is important too. So um, I think I posted just a video last week on that. Um, if you've seen that, I'm sure you've seen that, right? I saw it. Yeah. So that's just, again, it's, it's positioning my pelvis to uh, have a favorable spot for airflow to go. That's all it's really doing. I'm trying to block off certain, certain movements so that when I do inhale, air has to go somewhere. Um, of course, there's other ways of compensating around that um, and, and cheating. Even if I put myself in a posterior tilt, it doesn't make me a good breather. It doesn't allow expansion where I need it. But what it does is it gives me the chance, um, the better chance to experience certain expansion in, in places that I normally don't get it um, because I'm so used to pushing air right to my belly um, instead of, say, getting air to my right chest wall or even both chest walls. If people are missing internal rotation on in their shoulders, all I do is get them to properly expand both their chest walls and all of a sudden their, their internal rotation is fully back. It's like, it's amazing. You're thinking, I didn't even touch your, your, your shoulder and how, how is it possible? Like, well, you know, it's just what you're doing. I'm getting you to expand your chest. They're like, well, I already chest breathe. And these are like the people who don't understand respiration. So they're like, I already chest breathe. I'm like, I just think there's a misconception of what chest breathing is um, because your chest breathing is also your chest out which is the same thing as thoracic extension, moving right. towards extension. So I'm not going to be able to fully stretch these walls here when I'm doing that. Um, let's see. A couple other things that I see I can tell you um, since we're on the topic of just how, how we can compensate. Um, people will use that six-pack by the sternum as a, I could say it in many ways, I guess, as a protective mechanism maybe um, because their body doesn't feel safe when they're in a certain position trying to breathe. If their sternum wants to drop down and they keep that six pack working up here. Um, they're going to, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Me. They're, they're going to miss, they're going to miss internal rotation. They're not going to get expansion. Um, their necks are going to kick on like crazy and that's going to happen 25,000 times each day. And as long as that keeps going on, you can better believe the issues are going to start arising. Um, whenever it, whenever it happens. But, um, if you can't tell that six pack and that sternum to rest in a good spot, instead of that flex spot, um, when they're doing that posterior tilt, you're going to struggle and, and then you might feel it. So you might feel like you're putting them in a certain position, say a 90, 90. Um, <clears throat> I see that a lot where the six pack will turn on in a 90, 90, right. Or in all four, that's an, another common one because the people want to just round their spine actually. Um, whether they're trying to get air into their back ribs or, you know, they're just trying to feel hamstrings without extending. Um, their body isn't ready for it. Um, that six pack is going to turn on and it's going to keep going no matter what you do until you back them off and teach them just how to like calm down. Cause at the, at, a, at the root of all of this, it's just neurology. We're just trying to find a way to get you to relax. It's the same thing as if I were to take say FRC, I uh, say I'm doing just a, a lacrosse ball um, mobilization on my quad or something like that. They're ramping up and then they're trying to get your muscle to relax. It's really just, down to it all it's just neurology you know we're trying to find ways to get our body to relax and, and tone down so I, I don't think there's one way to do it I just think I just know respiration is a way that significantly works for me um, mm. and putting them in different positions when other positions fail uh, or they're not comfortable um, that's a big thing and knowing when to do that is is key to being effective and efficient in my treatments or if I'm training someone since I do both right um, so yeah that's it Awesome. Yeah. I hope that everybody's learning a ton from this. It's, it's super great information. Thank you. Um, okay. So you sound like you read a lot and you study a lot. So what is something you're reading currently um, or that you read, <clears throat> reading, oh my God, that you've read recently um, that you think that other people may enjoy? Who? Good one. Well, recently I've been reading this thing called building my own website just building my <laughs> that's the only thing i've been reading recently um uh let's see can i grab it for you yeah yeah totally I'll grab it i've been reading this thanks, thanks for, for the, the feedback, feedback. <laughs> that looks cool uh, I'll I'm going to so, link all this stuff in the show notes too. So people can <laughs> click it. 
So um, it's just ways to understand how to, um, you know, I used to take feedback really bad from people. I can tell you right now. So that. understanding that. who you're talking to is a big thing, whether it's your, your boss, family member, um, anything of the sort, and just understanding that maybe they're thinking something different when they're telling you this, but you might feel, I mean, I'm like, I, I feel like, why do you talk to me like that? You know? Uh, but now I, now I look at it from this angle with think books like this, there's a million books out there that can help you understand things like that, how to just not take things personal, um, how to just try to be empathetic to others and, and understand how they could just be thinking differently. Um, but this has been huge for me and also the way that I'm talking to my, my clients because I could have Mark over here who I can just, I know I can just drill him with certain hard words versus uh, right. Scott over here. I just can't talk to you that way. Right. What motivates both of them is something different. So I got to know what motivates both of them and make sure that I can um, make those adjustments in between sessions. Um, yeah. Or even if it's like an online client, you know, there's certain things I just got to adapt to. Um, so this book has been really cool. It's, of course, it's not anything anatomy or anything like that, but it's wow. my, um, it was my weaker suit that I've been trying to get better at. Um, so just studying things like this has uh, definitely helped me as a person. That's great. Cool. Thank you I for love sharing that. that. Yeah. Cool. It's a unique one as far as like what we've had suggested from people. So yeah. cool. I'm going to look into that one for sure. Cool. Um, so what do you current, what's your training currently like as far as your personal like movement each day? What are you into? Um, I just, I barely lift. I lift, I lift three times a week. I would say, um, I'm in the gym seven days a week. Don't worry, but it's because I'm messing around doing things for my, myself or work. I'm cre creating new exercises. Mm -hmm. um, um, that's how I study now. I'm just a nerd. So I am blessed enough to have a couple of gyms around me when I, I go to a certain gym that I pay for membership for, but I also work at independently for certain gyms. Um, so I can go there as well. So I do that. And cool. I just basically I'm, I'm, I'm trying to just move better and, and understand how I can make these, these shape changes in, in someone in myself, of course, but then trying to, I'll even ask people in the gym, Hey, you got 10 minutes for free. I'll just work with them for 10 minutes. Cause I'll just see what they're, what they're missing and things like that. So um, when it comes to that, um, beside that, I would say I am, um, I'm a quick get in the gym guy. I, I like to do a full body workout regardless of what I'm doing. Um, Unfortunately, I just don't have the time to work on getting massive like I used to. I, I think I've been 185 pounds for the last six years, and I haven't changed at all. So I, what I'm doing is something that's just kept me where I'm at, so I'm going to be happy with it. Um, I do an upper body, a lower body, um, and usually a push-pull and then a lower body, but I can tell you that I'm always doing a whole body thing regardless mm -hmm. what I'm doing. So that's just uh, kind of what I'm doing with my lifts. But it's funny, I would say, <laughs> I'll say this because I haven't said this before, um, say I'm going up a staircase, right? There's not a single set of stairs that I do not climb where I'm, I'm completely loading the right side. Then I'm thinking about going to load unless I'll jump up to the right, jump up to the left. I look like I'm just jumping side to side, freaking out, but it's really cause I'm just working on how I can feel certain things. And that's yeah. how I know I'm a nerd. I do that same thing. <laughs> so cool. Maybe not, not, maybe not that obvious, but I'm constantly like, cause I always have problems feeling like I feel like I am turned to my right and my pelvis at least. Like my right side's way easier to engage than my left. And I just feel like my left femur is like shoved into my, uh, like kind of internally rotated and also medially. Anyway, mm -hmm. people are going to die with this episode. Sorry, nerds. <laughs> um, but I'm like constantly trying to feel that left side. So I get it. No, I, I promise. I'm, yeah. I'm not the only one. Uh, it's, it's, You're not. Yeah, I'm, I'm bad. I'm bad. Alita I got like a 40 pound. Too. I got like a 40 pound backpack I carry around all day with my laptop and all this stuff. And I'm just running up the subway stairs with all these people just staring at me. I'm just like, well, if you've seen the subways in New York city, you know, there's a lot of strange individuals. So yes. yeah, it's not like I'm any different from anyone else. So yeah. well, it's not quite the same here. I can't <laughs> go to incognito, but oh. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I'll do it anyway. <laughs> I love it. Oh man. So we ask everybody, this question, what do you do to move your brain and move your body? But you just talked about what you do to move your body. So what do you do to move your brain? Well, you kind of just talked about both, but what's something different? Do them simultaneously, which is actually what I think most people should do. I do. Um, I do my, my breathing method, which is the Wim Hof method. Um, nice. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that go into that um, and how you do it. I had uh, I no think, idea you did that. Now I'm oh, yeah. intrigued. Oh, I, I never, we didn't talk about this before? No. Nope. Oh, so 
close to four years ago, I heard about Wim Hof and um, I was big into it. I'm like, what is this? Like, there's no way this guy just got injected with a virus yeah. purposely and, and fought it off. I'm like, that's not possible. And of course I was biased. And now I'm just like, there's just, that's incredible what this guy can do and he can teach everybody. So for myself, I started doing it. And whether it was a placebo or not, I can tell you every time I felt sick, I immediately went to my breath cycles and I did a whole three, four cycles and I wake up the next day completely normal, felt nothing. And I was a firm believer from day one after I felt the first episode of uh, what you feel the euphoric afterwards. It's incredible. Um, so I, I also have on the flip side, I would say I also have a certain way of looking at it because they, the way they do it is they'll do quick breaths in like hyperventilate like this <sighs> and what's happening. So the nerd in me is thinking extending my spine. Yep. So I'm, I'm constantly holding that down. Um, so that's the only alter, uh, I guess, modification I make with it uh, is I, I just make sure I contain a little bit of abdominal control when I'm doing it. So I don't know if it's for everybody, but <laughs> I definitely know it works, especially if you expose yourself to the cold afterwards. Um, yep. That has been a, big thing I was scared to do. My nervous system would go haywire. It would just freak out. Uh, and then I got used to it. And then I did a little war or a little colder every day, the showers I would do or the ice baths. And before you knew it, I was getting in full ice tubs, like, and I was hot and it's, it's, it's real. Like if you just train your mind to it, you get used to it. Um, that's, and that's what Wim Hof did, you know, cause his wife, um, committed suicide a very long time ago. That's, so that's why from depression. And that's why wow. he went on a, he went on a rampage to find out how he can cure depression. This is why he started it all. And he's done that. Like he's, he's already been scientifically proven to not attest it or tap into your brain, as he would say, um, basically control your immunity, right? Your emotions, your state. What is, of course that, you know, that comes with it all. He does movement, he does playing music. So all these things that are just chasing a certain state, a mental state, and it's a positive state. And that will take you out of any type of depression that you might yeah. be feeling. Um, and he, now he's back by science. So he, if you listen to him talk, he sounds crazy. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you haven't, please go listen to him. He's incredible. Uh, and, but when you understand it, you're like, whoa, this guy ha probably had no clue what he was doing, but he did something right. And he's now proven it. Cause when you hear him talk, you're just, you don't believe it, but totally. once you see the evidence, it's crazy. It's like people can't, well, I don't know. I mean, I guess it does sound kind of crazy, but if you think about it, like when you're depressed, it doesn't just like happen all of a sudden it's like a slow gradual onset and then mm -hmm. your body does certain things with that your immune system like everything you do whether it's like how you're thinking which affects how you move all that i mean that's going to affect your lymph mm -hmm. your blood flow everything and it makes total sense that you could also on the flip side reverse that with enough focus but i think i mean he's i actually i've only really only heard about him on like tim ferris and um sure. joe rogan and all the like podcasts that he's and actually i think another podcast that i listen to but i've never really looked into him that that closely so i actually am gonna now me I'm, too i'm totally i mean cold water please yeah i'll i'll uh i'll give you any information you I'm need but super interested we'll have to yeah. do the cycles together sometime because it's crazy oh. The feeling, the sensation you get afterwards is just insane. And you can, when you can find out that you can hold your breath after exhaling fully for like, I've done up to like three and a half minutes to where I felt calm after a full exhale, it blows your mind to think, how can I exhale and then not breathe for three and a half minutes That's without unbelievable. feeling stress, you know, but yeah. you have to build, right? Yeah. Um, and it just goes to show, you know, we, we don't, we don't tap into our brains like we probably can. Um, yeah. so it's a, it's a beautiful Definitely. thing to see. Wow. So, yeah. That's awesome. Cool. That's well, a good way to leave this podcast. I think. Leave yeah. People with that. <laughs> um, awesome. where can people find you if they want a session with you, if they want to do online work, how can people find you? Sure. So of course the rehab process on Instagram, same with Facebook, uh, Twitter is going to be the same. Um, uh, just message me on there. The, uh, the rehab process at gmail.com is my email. Um, I got a few locations in Manhattan as well as one in Brooklyn that I can train people at, whether it's for, uh, pains, rehab, I can, I love treating any, any end of the spectrum. So if there, you have pain, that's cool. I can help you out. If you don't have pain, you're just looking to move better. I got you. If you're just trying to get strong, I can do that as well. So, um, I'd love to love to work with anybody. Um, and uh, continue to, uh, speak with you, Alina. So I'm glad uh, awesome. you had me on here. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. 
no, I'm so glad to have you. You've been like kind of mentoring me the last uh, couple months. I have learned so much and it's been great. So we, we of course wanted you on the show. So thank you. So Thank glad. You. Cool.